Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Rebecca Bowling, and I am the director of the Drescher Center for the Humanities. And I would like to welcome you to today's Humanities Forum event. Our formal UMBC introduction to the Maryland Tradition statewide program to sustain living cultural traditions through field work and programming in the state. We've had the pleasure of working with the two co-directors of the program, Dr. Elaine F. and Dr. Cliff Murphy, over the course of this past year, and we are grateful to them for their work with UMBC and for bringing today's panel to us. I'd also like to extend a special welcome to the Maryland Traditions people who have been on campus today for their winter gathering meeting and who are mostly still with us, I think, to enjoy the panel. I'd like to thank the new Orser Center for the Study of Place, Community, and Culture for co-sponsoring today's event. Before I introduce Dr. F. and Dr. Murphy, let me remind you that we have three more Humanities Forum events this semester. In two weeks, Dr. Richard Long, Professor Emeritus from Emory University, will be giving our annual Daphne Harrison Lecture and speaking on the Harlem Renaissance personages and Haiti. I invite you to pick up one of our Humanities Forum calendars, I'll show you what it looks like, which you'll find on the various benches in the gallery. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our forum moderators, who will in turn introduce our other panelists. Elaine F. received a Master's in Museum Studies from Cooperstown Graduate Program and a Doctorate in Folklore and Folklife from the University of Pennsylvania. She directed cultural conservation programs for 20 years at the Maryland Historical Trust, the state's preservation agency. She is co-founder of Maryland Traditions. Since this past fall, she is folklorist in residence in UMBC's American Studies Department. She's known widely for her work with Baltimore screen painters and Smith Islanders, and some of you in listening to WYPR may have heard her at times on mm -hmm. Signal. Cliff Murphy has a master's and PhD in ethnomusicology from Brown University. He is a folklorist at the Maryland State Arts Council and has co-directed Maryland Traditions also since 2008. Cliff is a former working physician, has published articles. Musician. <laughs> Didn't I say musician? Physician. Didn't I say musician? Physician. Physician. I, you told me musician. You wrote musician. He's musician. <laughs> no, a former working musician. But I think he's just a musician. Oh, did I say physician? I'm going to have it a minute. Am I at the wrong event? OK. I thought this is a really a renaissance man. We're talking about renaissance. OK. So he is a working class. <laughs> he is a working musician and has published articles on the role of country and western and mariachi music in working class and musician communities and is a contributing producer for The Signal on WYPR in Baltimore and I have also had the pleasure of hearing him on the radio. Please join me in welcoming the Maryland Traditions to UMBC and in particular the panelist. Thank you. I forgot to I forgot to learn how to use this. Is this somebody I told somebody that I was an ethnomusicologist once. This is not a prepared joke, but I told someone I was an ethnomusicologist once and they thought I said ethno oncology. <laughs> is this forward? Which would be a fascinating field. Okay. Boy, what are we doing here? Um, <laughs> if you want the individual mic, just turn Yeah, let us know. Let us know for any reason you can't hear. All right. Well, thank you, Rebecca, for having us, and thank you, everybody, for being here. It's, uh, this is very exciting, and it's, I'm going to turn this over to Elaine, but I'm Cliff Murphy, and Elaine is going to take it from here. Um, we, we are two working folklorists. Um, we are public sector folklorists. You need to turn it on. It is on. OK. Um, can you hear us? Yeah. All right, great. Um, and um, we, um, actually, Maryland Tradition started in, uh, 2001, 10 years ago, we're very excited um, because I was a lone folklorist working in a state agency and uh, Cliff's predece um, predecessor, Rory Turner, was a lone folklorist working at a state agency. And the two of us said, well, let's, let's see, how can we find a way to cover the state 
a little more effectively um, in our quest for um, living traditions. Um, our job as folklorists is to identify, uh, chronicle, document um, as thoroughly as possible, um, present and work to sustain living traditions and the traditions that make Maryland, Maryland. Um, we had a really fascinating talk today about what is a Maryland tradition and you will see and you will know um, when this um, hour is over. Um, we uh, were lucky enough to be funded by the National Endowment for the Arts in their uh, Folk Arts Infrastructure Program to uh, start a statewide program, basically to build infrastructure um, on the ground around the state. And we have been very fortunate um, to work with a number of partners um, over these uh, 10 years. Um, the, the orange um, lettering just shows you the people who are here today who are going to share um, their um, kind of wonderful experiences in uh, doing what we do. Um, we are here because uh, we began in the fall of this year a, an, ex an exploratory foundational relationship with UMBC to see if um, Maryland traditions could live here, could thrive here, and could develop ways um, to build connections um, both on campus, off campus, and bring our programs in and bring you, uh, the students, faculty, and staff out uh, to uh, tradition bearers and to work with our programs around the state. So um, we are just really in our very beginning stages and I have found a wonderful home as folklorist in residence in the American Studies Department. I invite anyone to come and knock on my door at any time. Um, I may not be there, um, but, um, or to call, but we also want you to pick up these um, brochures. These are our brand new, hot off the press, um, Maryland Traditions brochures that are on your seats, um, which will tell us how you can get in touch with us. Um, we are all public folklorists. We all work in the public sector, although um, you'll hear that we've actually um, you know, made the jump um, into academic institutions as well. Um, we have been very um, fortunate in developing, oh, in developing <laughs> a statewide network, which uh, Cliff will tell you yeah, about. Yeah, so this is, uh, you know, I mean, this, the, the details here aren't terribly important, so you don't need to strain your eyes too much, but basically the colors here on this map show the, the geographic reach of each of our partners. So each color on this map um, corresponds with, with a different partner that um, basically is located at an institution that the, the idea here is that by, by our program helping to create a folk life program at a given regional institution, that over time that folklorist, that folk life program can become a known and trusted neighbor uh, within that section of the state so that they can be working with, uh, with different communities, with different tradition bearers to help to not only document the experiences of, of everyday Marylanders, but also to, uh, to build programs that celebrate and sustain uh, community traditions. And so this is, this is kind of how it breaks out right here in a colorful kind of way. Um, this map is really what happens when kind of a um, Maryland traditions kind of organization meets the state map makers. So <laughs> we realize it's a little hard, you know, to make sense. Right, of. and how do we do this? We do this through field work. Um, here you can see us in our native garb. Um, uh, we don't normally wear suits out in the field, though we do when we're visiting with traditional academics. Um, and uh, <laughs> that's a joke. Um, but here we have Cindy Bird out in the field doing some field work with, uh, with some hunting and trapping traditions on the Eastern Shore. Uh, Mark Purrier over here. Uh, Mark, what are you doing over there? Uh, this was a demolished garage that was one of the events around the DC Carnival, Caribbean Carnival. It was, okay. It's a specific event for co judging the constables. This is Car Dr. Kara Rogers Thomas doing the hard work of cleaning up after a festival. Um, <laughs> photographer Edwin Remsberg, whose photos you can see around here, uh, working on uh, beating some, or making some Maryland beaten biscuits. <laughs> um, which you actually beat. And I'm over there documenting some uh, traditional scrapple making down on the Eastern Shore. So. Oh, I was going to say, what about me? There's that me? lady in the middle. <laughs> oh, and the lady in the middle. <laughs> I, I guess I can address that. Um, one of the things we realized is there is a dearth of photographs of 
of documentarians documenting, uh, doing what they do. And so when I asked everyone for a photograph, including myself, we were really hard pressed because we are the you normal, we are the photographers, we are the oral historians, uh, we are the videographers, we are the conversationalists, we are the hunters of the gatherers. We are out there literally. Um, just meeting people, talking to strangers, and um, essentially learning more uh, more than you might get from a book, but hopefully that you will then be able to read in a book um, down the road. Um, this is me on my way to Cooperstown Graduate uh, Program. <laughs> so in my with my Volkswagen van, with my mother bidding me adieu and saying, "Folk art? What in God's name are you going to do with folk art?" <laughs> so. Uh, really, the the one of the one of the public faces of our program uh, is our, our the master artists that we work with that we bring into our master apprentice program. In 2004, Maryland Traditions started a, a master apprentice grant program where we give uh, grants to master traditional artists to take on an apprentice for a year and teach them what they do. So traditional arts. You know, being something that you learn uh, by example, by you know, by watching other people do, um, you know, in a in a kind of a community-based, one-on-one, face-to-face model, um, and so most traditional artists, and particularly those that we work with here in Maryland, are not full-time professionals at whatever their their traditional skill might be. Lafayette Gilchrist is is maybe an exception to that rule, um, but. You know, these are people who tend to have full-time day jobs, and then they do muskrat skinning and trapping uh, in their spare time. And so these grants can help people carve out some time to take on an apprentice to teach them what they do. So here we have Rhonda Aaron, who is a, a master trapper and muskrat skinner. And cook. But let me also mention, when she's not doing this, she works in the Cambridge Library in Cambridge, Maryland, on the Eastern Shore. <laughs> here we have. Ahmad Borhani, who uh, is, is over there on the far end of the screen, uh, who is an Iranian refugee who came here uh, after the revolution in 1979. And he lives in Baltimore County, uh, teaches a number of people uh, Persian classical music, um, a fabulous uh, artist, as well as an incredible storehouse of, of knowledge. Uh, here we have Mike Vlahovich, who uh, is is working on in this photo uh, uh, an apprenticeship in traditional skipjack restoration um, down in St. Michael's, Maryland. And uh, Carl Grubbs, who is a master uh, jazz musician who lives in Baltimore City, uh, working with Laffy Gilchrist uh, there in the background. So when we started the program in 2001, we didn't really know that we were going to create an apprenticeship program, but it seemed necessary. Obviously, um, as we worked with more and more artists, we realized that um, the only way to keep their traditions alive was to pass it on. Um, and that is how that uh, program, which gives $2,000 to the master um, and 200 to the apprentice, whether it's, um, and they can split it up however they like. Um, but as that program progressed, we realized that they had other needs. That um, and um, we developed a project grant category, at which um, gave $5,000 to nonprofits um, to do all kinds of, um, of tangible products, whether it be a book, a film, a festival, a, um, um, a CD. So actually, some of our artists were, were funded to do um, CDs. Others were, a, were able to um, develop festivals around their work. Um, this is a rather, um, a, a really terrific project, um, a photographic project that came out of Queen Anne's County, uh, documenting on tin t with, with historic tin type um, technique, phot photographic techniques, um, the chiefs of the Eastern Shore tribes. Um, in mm -hmm. the regalia that they chose to wear. Um, and it has become an incredibly um, important program in, in developing a dialogue that did not exist, both among these chiefs and among people all over the Eastern Shore. And this um, exhibit is, is traveling uh, all over the state. Um, other exhibits that we have funded include um, a really another remarkable exhibition um, by Marty Cooper. Marty Cooper happens to be a, a native daughter. She is a Baltimore um, um, photographer who has staked her career uh, in New York. She's internationally known. She is really the doyenne of hip-hop photography, um, B-girls, B-boys, and, um, and wrote, uh, photographed the book on subway graffiti. Um, when her 
parents died and left her a very small inheritance. She bought her country house, as she calls it, in, in West Baltimore, um, in the shadow of uh, the Holland's Market, and could not resist going into the streets, and just as she would anywhere else, um, essentially taking on uh, Southwest Baltimore. And the photographs um, that, sh that came um, out, that continue, because she can't stop herself, um, but this was one of our project grants that also has had a uh, a pretty great run. Um, we've done films on uh, river baptisms in Kent County. Um, we've done um, um, uh, uh, actually a CD uh, on the parodies that are written by Smith Islanders about themselves and their work on the water. We've done a multi-day event uh, looking at row house arts um, at the Visionary Museum. But um, again, nonprofits, and we would love um, UMBC uh, Foundation people to apply. Uh, every year we have, uh, one of the things that we do is to try to create public programs that, uh, that can bring uh, the public, the, yeah, really I guess the general public as well as uh, tradition bearers, the communities that we work with every day in our programs as well as the scholarly community, policy makers and cultural policy uh, together to have dialogue, to meet one another face to face, to learn from one another. and. Uh, Typically, this is held in Baltimore uh, in June, um, and every year up until this year, we have had what we call a gathering and showcase, where we showcase that year's um, master apprentice teams, uh, as well as some project grant recipients. And uh, this is it's it fosters some wonderful dialogue and moments. Here we have uh, West African musician and immigrant to Maryland uh, Sheikh Kamala Jabate uh, sharing a whoopie pie with uh, Mennonite. Baker uh, Ida Schwartzen Gruber from uh, from Garrett County, Maryland. Uh, some wonderful moments of, of multicultural dialogue uh, that you don't get to encounter every day. Uh, and one of the important things that we do, at least this is, I think Elaine and I feel this in a, in a personal sort of way, is that this program, we aim to give uh, people from the community voice so that we are not just doing what Elaine and I are doing right now, which is getting up in front of you and telling you about our program, but it's actually to bring people from the community onto stage and allowing them to share their stories rather than us doing all of the interlocutor sort of work. Um, so here we have what we call a narrative stage, looking at different uh, cooking traditions in the city of Baltimore. Um, Prem Raja Mahat, who's a Nepalese cook, uh, is the one who's in the center. Elaine, you would know everybody else, but that's probably more detail than we have to go into right now, um, because we have to get to some fabulous presentations by our colleagues over here. Right. So once we had we we uh, went from the apprenticeships to the project grants, all of which continue to the um, uh, showcase and gathering, all of which continue into this. Um, Wonderful June 18th, mark your calendars when we will have our uh, uh, soon to be named, presently called our extravaganza uh, on the streets of Baltimore at the Creative Alliance. So, June 18th, mark your calendars. Right, all day free. It's free. Um, but we, we needed to really reach out to people who didn't fall into any of these categories, but who were making really stellar contributions to the state, um, usually as individuals or as groups, but traditions that it were, in fact, often endangered. And so, um, as often, um, um, I think Rory and I used to take these long walks to Fort McHenry from the Arts Council, and that's where we would hatch, you know, like, what, what's going ha what's going to happen next? And we not only created, but we named the ALTA Awards, um, named for Dr. Alta Schrock, um, but also the acronym for Achievements in Living Traditions and the Arts. That's those, Dr. Alta Schrock. Those of you who don't, or no, don't know the name Alta Schrock, um, she was, she uh, uh, passed away just before she hit her 100th uh, birthday. Uh, but she really was the soul and an original native folklorist of um, uh, Garrett County. Um, she was the first Mennonite PhD, a PhD in biology, but when she wasn't out searching for exotic um, plants, she would be um, actually looking for people, uh, Amish and local people who were creating um, uh, traditional arts that didn't know they were artists for the most part. And so as a result, we looked for some of the kind of the great traditions. And some of, the, some of them are ones that actually 
we say will make will earn you the, a merit badge of a Marylander, namely the Outdoor Festival. Um, uh, some people call it the Muskrat Festival. This is Miss Outdoors. I call her Miss Muskrat um, because this is where the national the national Muskrat Skinning Championship is held every year, of which Rhonda Aaron is a world champion, um, who you saw as our uh, master. But this happens every uh, the last weekend in February every year, rain or snow or shine, and is really a remarkable event um, of, by, and for that community. And if any of you go, just wear your plaid flannel shirts. Um, another uh, Alto Award winner was Globe uh, Poster. Um, they are responsible for those probably garish, wonderful, fluorescent posters that you find on um, uh, on trees and telephone poles all over um, the city until laws kind of uh, forbade it. Um, and they were in very great danger and um, of closing and they, um, we, we could not believe that this could disappear. We're happy to report that they have just become a part of the Maryland Institute College of Art and will be a, uh, a teaching studio for letterpress type. Um, and most of their collection is going. Um, Smith Island Cake, the ladies of Smith Island, the Ladies Aid Society or the Methodist Women um, who preserved this tradition that has been going on for uh, generations and generations of no known origin and in, uh, in uh, October of 2009 became our state dessert. So, um, and it, this was really a very much a grassroots uh, initiative. We do. Uh, obviously, we're, we're doing a lot of field work, uh, not only Elaine and myself, but also each of our fabulous partners, only a few of whom are here at the, at the table. Um, and all of this material goes into archives. Uh, and these are intended not only to be resources for the communities that we document so that people can go and hear the voices of their ancestors so that they can learn about themselves, but also for people in the scholarly community to come and to be able to utilize this stuff for publications, for uh, public programs, for museum exhibitions, for documentary films. Um, we have the, the State Folk Life Program at the State Arts Council has been in existence since 1974. Um, Maryland Traditions has been a statewide program for 10 years now, but the archives actually extend back um, quick math, uh, 36 years. Um, so that's a pretty remarkable archive of, of material, and this is a real resource, and so give us a call. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is yours for the using. Um, I, we've been, we, we do our best to partner with, uh, with regional media. We've had an ongoing relationship for the past year and a half or so with WYPR, doing programs on The Signal. I show you this picture from one of the episodes that we had done. Uh, these are some musicians, some Appalachian gospel musicians from up in Cecil County, Maryland, who there's a tie-in. This is all coming full circle. So uh, these are descendants of, uh, of a musician named Ola Bell Reed, who is a somewhat prominent uh, old-time bluegrass country musician from Maryland who, who came here uh, from the North Carolina Blue Ridge uh, during the Depression. Uh, a number of different scholars involved in our program back in the 70s had worked very closely with her and her family. Uh, and then after David Wisnett, who I think was based here at UMBC in the American Studies Department, uh, after he, he moved away, uh, we fell out of touch with, with this community and we have recently gone back to reestablish those connections to see how things have or haven't changed over the past 30 years. And it's really been, uh, it's really been a, a remarkable experience and it's something that is a reminder to us that we are a known neighbor. Even though like our faces as folklorists affiliated with this program change over the years that when, you know, when I met with these folks, um, they literally pulled out books, publications that folklorists involved in our program had done and they said, hey, we know you. Look, you put us in this book, which is pretty remarkable. Uh, so. so here we are at UMBC. We have been uh, planning programs, working with the Shriver Center. We have students doing service learning um, now, actually working um, in uh, the Fells Point community, which we're very excited because they're both Spanish speakers. And we've been wanting to work with that community. And so your, um, your peers are actually, and, and students are helping us to break new ground and do new research. Um, so I want to invite you all to a little um, a, um, experimental um, film series that we are partnering with um, CADVC over in the Fine Arts um, 
uh, gallery beginning uh, for every Wednesday except the first in April um, from the free hour films we're calling it and we're going to start with a series Baltimore films Baltimore people so um, come and see a 30 minute documentary about a Baltimore subject pick up flyers as you leave and um, um, then meet someone who's related actually to that tradition. Um, we're going to go now, but and when we get in our cars, we never know when we're going to find yet another tradition to follow. So this is one we've been on the trail of for a long time. So I want to just thank you. <laughs> I want to thank you all. I want to thank um, the Humanities Center. Thank you so much for inviting us. This has been in the planning for a long time. I want to thank American Studies, the Orser Center, uh, John Jeffries, Dean Jeffries, thank you. Ed Orser, we are indebted, and Nicole King wouldn't be here. And most of all, uh, thank we would not be here if it weren't for Tom Beck and this uh, wonderful space that we so enjoy being in. So I am going to pass the torch on to uh, Kara Rogers Thomas. Kara is our folklorist at Frostburg State University. Um, she is um, has been there since 2005 when that program began. She just received tenure, which we are very proud, and just had a baby uh, a month later, <laughs> or a month before. Kara <laughs> um, got her doctorate from Indiana University, and I'm going to let her take, take over. Yeah, okay. I'll just talk about. Okay. I don't want it anyway. Oops. Do it. All right. Why isn't it coming up over there? Any idea? Chris is good at I'm sorry, I'm seeing it on my screen, but I'm not seeing it on that screen. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> There you go. Thank you. <laughs> and then if you have trouble finding the cursor, there you go. Okay. That's fine. So yes, thank you so much for inviting us today. It's an honor to be part of the Maryland Traditions panel. I am Dr. Kara Rogers-Thomas, and I'm going to use my teaching voice. Can everybody hear me if I use a teaching voice? Okay. I've developed this over the course of several years now, so I think I really shot quite well. Um, I started at Frostburg State University in 2005, and I was a freshly minted PhD at the time, had defended my dissertation in October of 2004. On my way home from my dissertation defense, I got a phone call, I was pulled over to a rest area, and I was offered the job. So I thought, wow, this is wonderful. How often does a folklorist defend her dissertation and get offered a job in the same week, basically the same day? It doesn't happen very often, I'll tell you that. So um, the job was really appealing to me because the entire time that I was pursuing my graduate degree in folklore and American studies, I was really torn. I was trying to decide, do I want to be a public sector folklorist and do public programming and go out and do a lot of wonderful field work and put radio programs together and work on festival design, or do I want to be an academic? Do I want to be teaching? And I had had lots of teaching experience by that time, and I just couldn't make a choice. I had my foot in both worlds. And this position, as it was advertised by Frostburg State University, allowed me to take a position where I did not have to choose. I was able to be both an academic and a public sector folklore. I was the best of, the best of both worlds. Um, and it continues to truly be the best of both worlds. The program was developed by Maryland Traditions. They were looking for a partnership in Western Maryland. And they were interested in basically beating on the door of whoever would listen in Western Maryland, saying, we really want a folklorist working in this area of the state, documenting living traditions in this area of the state. And when they knocked on the door of Frostburg State University, Frostburg State University said, wonderful, that sounds like a fantastic opportunity for us. You mean that you're going to pay us to hire somebody to teach a couple of classes? It doesn't get any better than that. So I came in in January 2005. Not a good time to take a position in Western Maryland, if nobody's ever been to Western Maryland. Lots of snow in January. So I took the position then, and basically I was faced with this challenge of how do you design a program when there's never been a program such as this before, or the last time we had a working folklorist at Frostburg State University was 30 years prior. Everybody had kind of forgotten what folklore was. 
it was wonderful for me on some accounts because I got to create my own program, you know, design your own program from scratch. On the other hand, it was incredibly challenging because I was designing my own program from scratch. I learned a lot of lessons on the way. Um, I've made a lot of mistakes on the way as well. The first thing that I really started to think about, though, is how does my position as a folklorist doing public sector folklore and teaching at Frostburg State University, how can it enhance the mission of Frostburg State University? In 2006, the university went through a large planning process where we came up with our strategic plan that was supposed to get us through the next five or six years. And during the process of having many conversations and developing a strategic plan to kind of set a course for Frostburg State University, we decided that we really wanted to focus on what we called a seal of excellence. And we wanted to say, this is really what Frostburg is all about. It's about sustainability, it's about engagement, it's about academics, and it's about leadership. And once we had kind of this framework, I started thinking about, well, how can my program fit under this umbrella? And I really looked at this idea of engagement. For me, it seemed like this is where public sector folklore really fit in at Frostburg State University, providing members of the FSU community with opportunities for educational, economic, and cultural engagement. Folklore is cultural engagement. Folklore documentation allows for cultural engagement. It also allows for one to bridge what had become kind of a town gown divide in Frostburg. There was a disconnect between the population of the university and the residents of Frostburg and Allegheny County. And so my position allowed me to create programs that would bring those two disciplines and those two um, populations together. And so I really focus on engagement. And the programming that I do continues to focus on engagement. The program that I'm probably most proud of is the Frostburg State Appalachian Festival. It was established in 2006, and we are getting ready to go into our sixth year. And it's a celebration of the region's natural landscape, history, culture, food, musical, and artistic traditions. Basically, I say all that which makes Appalachia unique. When I was developing the idea of the festival, I was doing field work, and I was encountering all of these wonderful tradition bearers, and I was realizing that they didn't necessarily know each other. And I started to think about, wouldn't it be wonderful to create a venue so all of these tradition bearers can come together and create a network of traditional artists? Wouldn't it be wonderful if everybody in Western Maryland got to be the same incredible individuals that I was meeting in doing my documentation? And that's really where the idea for the festival came from. Today, it's much more than a folk festival. We do much more than focus on tradition bearers. We also look at issues in Western Maryland, in the Appalachian region, that are very critical for Maryland residents. So, for instance, at our last festival, we had a panel on the Marcellus Shale issue and natural gas drilling in Western Maryland. We've had programs on industrial wind production in Western Maryland, and we've had programs on mountaintop removal and strip mining in Western Maryland. So they're critical issues. We also talk about economic development in Western Maryland. And of course, the core of the festival is always going to be tradition. It's always going to be having the artists there, doing their demonstrations, having two musical stages, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I just wanted to show a few slides to give you an idea of what the festival is all about. And hopefully you can make your way to Western Maryland this September. It's always the third week of September. It's um, September 16th and 17th. Most of the activity happens on that Saturday. And as you can see, we have both performances, two different stages going on simultaneously, as well as workshops, hands-on workshops, and a number of narrative stages and discussions. And if you have children, we have a very active children's tent where kids can come and You'll see the image soon and play with the goats. Um, they can actually milk a goat and learn how to milk a goat and do hands-on activities in that children's tent. It was very interesting. After the first year that we had the festival, I had a student from Baltimore who obviously was not raised in the country at all. And he was writing his reflection paper on the Appalachian <laughs> Festival. And in his reflection paper, he said, I really enjoyed meeting the donkeys and getting to pet donkeys. And I thought, 
there weren't any donkeys at the festival, and it took me a while to realize he was talking about the goats. So I had to go back and kind of tell him, okay, this is what a goat looks like, and this is what a donkey looks like. And so I think that we're performing a very valuable service through the Appalachian <laughs> Festival in Western Maryland. Um, and, it, and kind of continuing that theme of engagement, more recently, in 2009, we started a venue, Mountain City Traditional Arts. And it is a venue that's actually located on Main Street in Frostburg, Maryland. It's about five blocks away from our main campus, so students actually have to walk five blocks up the hill, which they complain about. Um, and is dedicated to the education, sales, documentation, and perpetuation of traditional arts in the Mountain Maryland region. The way that it works is essentially for the sales, it acts like a consignment shop. We give our tradition bearers the option of doing a 30-70% split on all sales if they agree to either give a couple of intensive workshops throughout the year or come and demonstrate maybe four times a year. And that means that 30% of the sale price goes back into Mountain City Traditional Arts to keep the lights on, pay the rent, do publicity. And 70% of that total sales goes to the artist. If the artists have no desire to do that, we have a straight 50-50 split for the artists. And that's actually worked quite well. What I found is the vast majority of our artists are very interested in that 30-70 split. And they're happy to come and to share their craft all that they can. So a few images of the types of things that you see at Mountain City Traditional Arts. It's not necessarily just a storefront, it's also a venue. We have workshops on a regular basis, we have performances there. Um, you can come and learn traditions. The type of traditions and artwork that we present at Mountain City Traditional Arts are quite accessible. There are traditions that if you really have an interest in learning them, it's not beyond you. You could come take a class and learn how to do such things as create braided rugs traditional braided rugs. In addition to focusing on engagement, over the few, past few years, as I progress in teaching, I really started to focus on another aspect of our strategic plan, which is leadership. Attracting and building leaders by providing exceptional developmental opportunities included service learning and experiential learning. My programs really focus on providing my students hands-on experience doing tangible products and offering them to a regional audience. My students are part of the Appalachian Regional Commission's teaching project, which involves about 14 different institutions of higher education throughout the Appalachian region. Each one of those institutions has a class which works on some sort of critical issue to Appalachia and does service learning, and then they all gather together in December to talk about their projects and compare the results and talk about how to solve critical issues in the Appalachian region. So my students were utilized in developing Mountain City Traditional Arts. It was their vision that I was drawing from to develop Mountain City Traditional Arts, and it was their labor that I was using to create Mountain City Traditional Arts. In addition to that, for the past few years, my students involved in that project have been doing their own documentation, have been going out doing their own field work, and they've been presenting that field work at those annual gatherings. And these are the kind of posters that they put together in addition to putting together a presentation and talking about their research in front of about 200 people that are gathered there for that event. And today, we've developed an institutional priority, revisiting that strategic plan and looking at institutional priorities and developing three institutional priorities, one of which, again, focuses on experiential learning, providing students with opportunities to develop programs both inside and outside the classroom. And these are the sort of things that I'm working on now, thinking about how do I retool my classes so that my students can actually be developing their own public programs, so that they're not necessarily just doing what I tell them to do, but so I'm giving them the tools, I'm allowing, I'm building the framework to allow them to create their own programs. And that's what we're going to be experimenting with this fall. And I'm hoping that it goes well. But none of this would have been possible without this partnership between Maryland Traditions and Frostburg State University that started it all. And I'm very, very pleased to be on board with Maryland Traditions, and I hope that they are pleased with the results of this partnership. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank you, Tara. Uh, I just want to point out, um, 
uh, that all of these photographs you see here are the documentation that um, is done every year when we visit our masters and apprenticeships to sort of check in and do an oral history and photograph. And Edwin Remsberg is the photographer. Um, Edwin, come and stand up and get the credit you deserve. But please, at some point, um, come and um, if you come to our event in June, you'll see this year's crop of photos and apprentices. Um, in addition, I want to take, thank Sammy Hawkins, who was my student um, in the humanities seminars this um, fall, for being our helper and timekeeper today. And shout out to all the kids in the back row. Thank you for coming. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, now I'd like to introduce Cindy, mm -hmm. um, who, <laughs> um, who um, has been at the Ward Museum since 2007. She will tell you more. Um, she received her um, doctorate from my same place I did, University of Pennsylvania, and she will share her stories. <laughs> There's a lot to share. I'm not sure if I have the same uh, vocal power that Kara has, but I'm going to try to get by without the microphone if everybody can hear me okay. All right, good. Um, I'll try to get through this without sounding like an auctioneer. Um, I notice the time is, is creeping up on us, so I will um, try to move it along. Okay, as um, Elaine said, um, I'm with the Ward Museum of Wildfowl Art. We are affiliated with Salisbury University, and I'm here to, uh, my presentation is entitled Pass It On, Cultural Traditions of the Lower Eastern Shore. Pass It On also happens to be the catchphrase for Maryland traditions, and at the time we came up with the title for this project, I didn't actually sync those two things together <laughs> in my head, but I think it's a wonderful, uh, possibly coincidence, possibly subconscious thing, but anyway. Um, so the picture you're seeing there is, is from uh, the Crisfield Crab Festival there. Um, I'm Cindy Bird, uh, curator and folklorist at the Ward Museum. You're seeing my glamour shot from, <laughs> from field work. And as Elaine said, we don't get a lot of these pictures. And the only reason we got that one is because we were kind of fooling around. So there you go. That's me in camo on a goose hunting trip with uh, hunters. I want to tell you a little bit about our institution. Um, we I have a little bit different uh, situation than, than uh, what you heard from Kara. Um, we're a museum associated with a university, so I'm there as a curator at, as well as a folklorist. So I'll tell you just a short background about our institution. Um, the Ward Museum was founded by the Ward Foundation. Um, we started, uh, the Ward Foundation started in 1968 but the museum itself started in 1976. We've always had a connection to Salisbury University. Um, we, start, we actually opened on the campus in Holloway Hall, which is this big, beautiful building there, but we quickly outgrew that. Um, a campaign was begun to raise money for us to have our own building, and we moved into that building in 1993. So we've got very uh, much closer connections with the university now, and so we, we build those connections uh, more and more each year. Um, just to give you an idea of, of our subject matter, our genre, um, we were named for Lim and Steve Ward of Crisfield, Maryland. They were um, renowned um, bird carvers. Uh, they carved working decoys, but as the market changed for uh, gunning decoys, they began to carve more and more decorative pieces. People were uh, less in need of hunting decoys because they, it was less legal to take so many birds and they were more interested in souvenirs to, for their mantle. So they began to carve uh, more decorative pieces and this genre is, it's not exclusively American but it's definitely distinctively American and so we house birds in our collection from those working decoys to more contemporary sculpture and as well as other types of um, art centered around birds. We have two major annual events that we, um, that we have in the spring and the fall. Um, the Chesapeake Wildfowl Expo takes place in the fall, and the Ward World Championship Carving Competition and Art Festival takes place in April in the spring. And just to say a couple of things about the pictures you see here, on the left you see a traditional style of decoy, reminiscent of the American working decoys of the 19th century. And I won't hang up on this too much, but on the right you see a contemporary style of carving. As, they, as bird carvings became more detailed and gunning laws changed, you saw the demand for decorative pieces increase, 
and this is sometimes said to have evolved from these um, working birds, but they actually recall traditional European animal carvings that sometimes, in many cases, predate the heyday of market cutting. So they have a tradition of their own, and we celebrate both styles. Okay, the Lower Shore Traditions Program is the um, name of our, of our um, Maryland Traditions uh, funded programming. It's the traditional arts programming at the Ward Museum. And the pictures that you see here represent the last three years of themed program that we've had. Each year we try to have a theme outside of our usual, um, our, our usual programming. And uh, you see the Smith Island cake that was in our Delmarva Cooks programming. You see our, you see our hunting programming. And you see uh, beekeeping, which was in last year's programming. Um, we do regional carving exhibits from all over the state and even occasionally outside the state. And now um, you see we have educational offerings which connect to the university and elsewhere. I'd like to get very quickly to the highlight of today's talk, our, our um, Pass It On book. This is our um, Cultural Traditions of the Lower Eastern Shore, which is a curriculum that we've designed um, based on a need that was seen by our K-12 teachers in the area. Um, this is based on Maryland Traditions field work for over nine years and also through use of Maryland Traditions archives. Cliff mentioned the archives that have been built over the years. And people think of archives as sort of dusty storage of things that are done over the years, but this is actually practical use of Maryland Traditions archives and, and, and research. So it incorporates our research and that of other Maryland Traditions partners. We've um, worked actively with students at Salisbury University, the work of interns, graduate assistants, and research assistants, their photography, their writing, all of that has been incorporated here. So this has been a great opportunity for students to participate in our work. It's also used on the university level. Obviously, the teacher education department has um, incorporated this into some of their work. But it's also been used for classes in cultural heritage and tourism and in folk art and crafts. So there, it's very multidisciplinary. Um, the four units in the book are working the water, living off the land, sporting and playing, and folklore and folk life. So we had to use the word tradition in a, in a broad sense. So we use a lot of, we incorporate a lot of history, a lot of land use, agriculture, and also uh, some of the tourism traditions that exist on the Eastern Shore. Okay. It's important, I have a few copies here if you're an educator, you're particularly interested in the Eastern Shore and you want to use this as a model for, for a similar project, something like that. I have a few copies for distribution, but the entire content is available on our website. We have um, activities, it comes with lesson plans, there are audiovisual supplements, interviews, videos, all kinds of great stuff to go with it. So you can download the whole thing in PDF format with all the supplements at wordmuseum.org and um, we have a survey there so I'm collecting feedback for it and I would just love to see everybody's feedback. And a word from our sponsors. <laughs> this, <laughs> this project, <laughs> I, have to, I have to acknowledge everybody who helped with this book. You, you'll see on, in, if you look at the, there's a copy back in the area where there's coffee for everybody at the end to, to look at at your leisure. And I have a few copies for people to pass around. But um, this was funded and, and helped and contributed to by dozens of people and institutions. So I have to thank them. And last but not least, here's our contact information. If you want more information, you can get in touch with me at, at this information. So, auctioneer, time <laughs> over. Did I make it in the yeah, 10 minutes? <laughs> Thank you. OK, I would be uh, very much remiss if I did not introduce Laura Bottinelli. Um, Laura was our original folklorist um, at the Ward Museum in starting in 2000 and and um, actually was so successful at her job that she's now the executive director of the museum. Um, so we've been very lucky to continue the thread. And that was that wonderful case of a museum that came to us and said, we need to breathe life into the artifacts that we show. Um, so Laura, thank you. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Mark Purrier, who um, 
ha will tell you about his work in Montgomery County, um, who is a ethnomusicologist, a graduate of University of Maryland, College Park. <laughs> Thank you, Elaine. Thank you. Um, we're running short on time, so no, I'm going to go as fast as I can with this. Um, first, I've got to find it. The work that was done with Maryland Traditions and my work was done in um, Montgomery County with the Arts and Humanities Council of Montgomery County. Um, I'm not a great multitasker here, but we'll get it together. Press F5. I had to get get yours off, Sorry. and then F5. You said for the yeah, screen. Yeah, once you open yours up, if you yeah. press F5, it'll come up here. All right, there we go. Um, and really, what I'm focusing on is really engagement in communities. As many of you may know, um, Montgomery County has one of the largest populations of any county in Maryland, approaching a million people. It also has a very diverse population, and within that population, I've been looking at a couple of things around traditional arts and how different cultures and different people in those communities deal with traditional arts. And the first thing I really want to talk about is the modes of communities exerting agency, how they perceive of presenting themselves. I think some things, in my experience, I've worked at uh, National Endowment for the Arts over the years with National Heritage Fellowships, uh, worked in uh, overseas. And one thing I noticed in this type of work is sometimes there is a subtle uh, moment when someone is exerting their agency or trying to tell you things and you might miss it if you're just looking too close, looking for tradition, looking for what you recognize as tradition. So I really tried to uh, focus on that in, in my work in Montgomery County. As I said, it's a very rich county. We have a lot of people of very high education levels, uh, you know, East Indian folk who, you know, or musicians as well as being scientists working at Johns Hopkins. Uh, for me to make an assumption about their tradition or their not having a certain tradition or the way they interpret their tradition I think is, is wrong in a way and, and really to let them be my guide as to understanding how they interpret tradition because it is what they're doing in this culture in America. And then there's also this modes of individual presentation, how people present themselves. And uh, when I think of this, I'm really thinking of uh, cross-generational uh, aspects of tradition. When you look at, uh, say, from examples you'll see in future slides, there's a community in Montgomery County, Cambodian Buddhist, Buddhist Society. And they work in their temple, and they work with children of all different ages as well as adults. And what's very fascinating to me there is that you will, you know, not you, but a person could make an assumption based on someone's appearance, again how they might be or what they might be about. And as you engage with that community, you realize there's multiple levels of self-representation. And really, again, the dynamics of traditional cultural arts, how these things are being modified. They're, they're not static. Um, I think of, again, this Cambodian uh, community where there's a family, it's actually Chumyek, who's a National Heritage Fellow. He's also been apprenticed, master apprentice with uh, Maryland Traditions. And he has a son and daughter who are very talented musicians, yet very different people, very different individuals. Um, the daughter is, plays music very actively with him. His son is an incredible musician, but has you know, other passions in his life. But he still can engage. And, and it's very interesting to see that whole dynamic in that community. Um, the other thing I looked at is really just fostering active engagement and ongoing involvement. And that is in terms of what I did with the Arts and Humanities Council. We were a grants giving organization. I'm, I make sure you understand I'm no longer there. I'm now at the Smithsonian. But the Arts and Humanities Council gave grants and as such had a certain you know, relationship with artists. They weren't a producing organization. So most of what the Arts and Humanities Council was used to doing, the mode of operation was bringing in applications, paneling experts, and giving out grants. I was working with some communities that that whole concept was very foreign. It was not only foreign, but it didn't even make sense, as you'll see. Um, one of the first things I noticed that it was really important for me to do was to work with partnerships around the county. This is an event that was called the uh, World of Montgomery Festivals, pr pr produced by um, a number of organizations. One of them was actually uh, a housing advocacy organization as well as county government. And what I did in this capacity is my in 
involvement here was to act in a curatorial role as well as helping with some resources from Maryland Tradition to bring artists to the program. Um, another way of just the, the deepening levels, I worked with some photographers that were there, that uh, Debbie Adler who took this photograph here. And what my images I'm trying to capture and the images I'm showing you is just this, this the multiple layers of connection. This was a group that's actually Shea Kamalaji Abate's group who you saw in an earlier uh, slide by Cliff. He's a Malian griot, plays the Ngoni. Gentleman here playing the Dun Dun is actually from Cameroon. The gentleman here dancing just happened to be there. And it was a very interesting dynamic in that this group uh, really brought the audience out of themselves in a way that was, uh, you know, just, I think, I won't, I'm tempted to use the word magical, but it's, it's not so much magical. It's very intuitive on the part of the musicians because this is what they would do in their own culture. Um, had we said stay on the stage and, you know, just do your work on stage, this wouldn't have happened. Uh, you know, Mr. Joseph Nguag came off the stage, uh, went down into the audience, actually engaged children, adults, everybody, got people up out of their chairs, and it was a very beautiful example. Here we have the same event. Um, this is the daughter of a gentleman who teaches uh, Wushu, and she's a high school student. Again, dealing with uh, this art form, which is probably very appealing to a lot, of a lot of her peers. However, it's not the fighting form. It's really the performative form of Kung Fu. And um, I encountered him at another event we did called Magical Montgomery, the Arts and Humanities Council. And actually, she was my interpreter. She helped me speak to her father because he's limited English. And through that process, I came to know her interest, and we had her perform here, as well as some of his other students. Um, and this is a, just a shot of Sheikh on stage again. And you notice the group is very multicultural. It's not simply, uh, you know, he's from Mali. There's a gentleman from uh, Cameroon. There's also a gentleman from the US and the other musicians from the U.S. in the background. And finally, the last slide from this whole pr production was this group that is long established in, in Montgomery County, and it's a youth organization, again, organized by a Chinese community, and they do the lion dance. This isn't New Year's. This was a, a festival. They contributed their performance for the festival and did a processional through the festival grounds. It was very, very, very rich. Uh, again, I, I think what I'm pointing out here, not think what I'm pointing out, but what I'm really pointing out is this engagement across cultural lines as well as across generational lines because I think it's very rich to see, again, the children of these different communities engaging and exhibiting themselves not only as ethnic others but actually as Americans. It's multi-layered multi and I really think that's important, especially in Montgomery County. Uh, this group is a good example, Ritmos, um, excuse me, Ballet Folklorico, Ritmos del Peru, I'm going a little fast. They have uh, an amazing organization. They did not deal with any grants. They did not deal with any type of institutional grant giving. And they, this is just an example of a production they did. It's not the best slide, but uh, it's the best I could capture. They did a whole evening production, basically using sponsorships from it with the Peruvian community. The organizers are two, uh, well, there's multiple layers of organization, but the two key people, one is a dance person, the other is, does music, and they had an amazing, I, I visited them at the rehearsal place, which is actually a community center in um, a town, or Lincoln Park in Montgomery County, which was historically a black community, and now is becoming mixed with Hispanic and black, and they work there. So. Uh, here, um, we're looking at a card that we designed for the Arts and Humanities Council, basically a rack card. You're seeing both sides. And what we're trying to do here is also recognize that in just using some of the language to entice people, different languages that we found through working with the county government, the most popular and most used in the county, Spanish, Chinese, and uh, French, uh, we were trying to elicit and, and reach out to the community. And the rest is being in English in that we did not have resources to really do multiple cards in multiple languages. This is another event that we worked with some local musicians in called the Human Rights Arts Festival. It was actually organized by the um, Amnesty International. Uh, using resources we had, we programmed a, a really a, a nice two performances. This was Samia Mahboud Ahmad. 
uh, a, a Hindustani singer and her group, and she delved into really a lot of spirituality and things around, um, I'm sorry, I'm losing it here, but really dealt with spirituality across cultures in the Indian world, both the Islamic, Hindustani, and other cultures. And this is Lilo Gonzalez. Lilo is a, a transplant to Montgomery County from Washington, D.C. via El Salvador. Leo was uh, actually an illegal alien at some point in his, his uh, life in the Americas and then got legal status. He works with children again. And I really, again, want to point out that that's something I felt very strongly about is this cross-generational connection. Um, as people interpret, you know, younger generations interpret their ethnicity, their identity a little different. Um, and Lilo was very great in doing this program. He brought some incredible musicians with him, very professional, and uh, was very excellent. And as well, he had the kids up and dancing. I mean, little, little kids who knew him from his work in the schools were just in the audience going crazy. And he could switch modes from singing a children's song to singing a song about political issues just like that and really reach multiple levels of the audience. Here's just an example of coverage we got on this event through really the agency of Samia and uh, her connections with Voice of America. Again, this is going, I'm going to go quickly through this. This is Carib Caribbean Carnival, another example of not only um, a s community organizing itself, but also across juris jurisdictional lines. The events take place both in Maryland and D.C. Gentleman you see here is Jackie Cumberbatch. He's very famous uh, in the Caribbean communities from Trinidad in designing Caribbean carnival costumes. This is his workshop, or what they call the yard. It's behind his house in Tacoma Park. And he does a lot of, this is not Jackie in the image. Here they're loading up for what's called the Dimanche Gras, which is an event where it happens before the parade in DC and it happens in Maryland, but it's really a judging of costumes. Uh, costumers and folks come from all over Maryland and and even beyond Maryland. This is one of Jackie's designs uh, going on stage with the young lady. Uh, again, this is a very rich community. Folks came down from New York, uh, New Jersey for this. This is another one of Jackie's designs. So this again, Jackie and this whole community work fairly insularly. Uh, we were trying to make connections, make really lasting connections with them. Finally, um, closing out, I want to talk about the APA program at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival, which I consulted on as a result of our field work. Cliff also helped with this. And um, this was a really nice program because it focused on Asian Pacific Americans in the Washington metropolitan area. It was last year's Folklife Festival. And the person you see here is Kyoko Akamoto, who is a longtime resident of Montgomery County, teaches at the University of Maryland College Park, Koto. She has a group called the Washington Toho Koto Society, where are they based? Montgomery County. So this jurisdictional issue is one other thing I found interesting in that I felt um, the borders that we have in this, and really the political borders that we have, Montgomery County, Washington, D.C., Maryland, Virginia, whatever, the communities go beyond those and how to work with those communities effectively and finding ways to work. This is an example of the command excuse me, the Cambodian Buddhist Society group doing actual folk dance uh, at the festival. And as you can see, again, cross-generational group here. Um, they don't normally do this type of work. They mostly focus on classical Cambodian dance and classical performance. And this was done especially for the Folklife Festival, as well as this dance that they do usually at their Cambodian New Year celebration at the temple, which is on New, Ham New Hampshire Avenue. Again, this is a youth dance. Uh, more of a, a courting dance using coconut shells and so forth. This is more representational of their work, and this is uh, more of the Cambodian style of uh, court dance. The gentleman there on the left is uh, Chum Yek, uh, there in front of the Ranik, the xylophone. He's the master musician, world renowned. And this is a really, uh, this community just really much impressed me because having worked with them engage with them at different levels. Uh, they have also received apprenticeships from Maryland Traditions. They've, as I said, Chumyak has received national recognition from the National Endowment for the Arts. Yet when you go to that temple, you would not, no one's putting on airs. Everyone is very much a family sort of mode. It's, it's really supportive. Uh, it was very encouraging for me to see, again, young people coming in with their parents, with their mothers, with their fathers, and just, you know, more or less 
not so much switching modes, but dealing with multiple modes of existence in the United States. I mean, being as cool as they want to be, and at the same time, really engaging with tradition, and uh, how, how that strengthened identity. Um, this picture I just threw in for the fun of it. Um, this is You Know Who at the Folklife <laughs> Festival with Samia, who also performed there. Cliff did some presenting at the festival. And wrap it up, um, again, through, I guess, th th to be just simply honest, through my relationship with the Cambodian group, they put the person at Voice of America who pro, you know, does their coverage for the Khmer in touch with me, and we you know, had a little conversation and actually got a little quote in their article. The important thing about these, both of these articles to me is that this is m information going out back to their home community in their home countries about what they're doing here. And not that I'm quoted in it, but just that this is very interesting, another level of agency. They want their people at home to know as many of these people are not simply, you know, they're, mo they're multiple modes of existence. So um, I had some other notes, but I'll, in the sake of time, I just raced through them. Um, we're out of time. Okay. But it's really about really establishing uh, multiple respect and, and um, serving in an active way and, and encouraging their active participation. Um, the success in getting folks like this to apply for grants is not always as high as we would like it to be. However, it's an ongoing process. I think they have to be encouraged. And uh, I think with the Maryland Traditions Program, the apprenticeships, there's a lot of good activity there. But as far as applying for project grants from the Arts and Humanities Council, sometimes that seems almost insurmountable when their normal modes of doing uh, work very effectively for them. So this is a, it's an ongoing engagement. Thank you. Thank you. Any, uh, Mark did such a great job at the Smithsonian Festival last year that they have uh, they wooed him away from uh, Montgomery County uh, Arts and Humanities, and he is now developing a. Um, Summer of summer program for this year's Folk Life Festival on um, rhythm and blues. So it should be promises to be extremely successful. And Globe Poster is doing the poster for it. So now I'd like to introduce Lafayette Gilchrist, um, who is this is really saving the very best for the last. Um, and as you know, our our mo is generally to work with uh, with um, with the uh, tradition bearers and. Uh, Lafayette is uh, one of our masters and uh, one of our apprentices. He served first as an apprentice and ultimately became a master in our program. And um, this is, I think, where the rubber hits the road. Um, there is no more compelling um, story than, I don't even want to introduce him uh, any further except to say that he is probably one of the premier jazz um, piano players um, in this region, um, if not farther, plays internationally. Um, but it all started right here, and herein lies the tale. Lafayette, and oh, then he's going to play for you um, when he finishes his no, remarks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yes, that's, that's very much true. It did. Um, can you hear? Oh, can everybody hear? All right. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much true for me. I started here and um, really rather stumbled into music unexpectedly. Uh, I came here as a freshman in the fall of uh, 1985. And uh, I hadn't had any background in, in, in music, uh, per se. I happened to be uh, taking an English class uh, for uh, admittance uh, into the, uh, the fall program. You had to come during the summer and I had to take an English class. And the English class happened to be uh, in the uh, Fine Arts Building. And in that building, uh, pianos, um, I don't know how, how it is today, but at that time, they were left unattended. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I became uh, sort of the phantom uh, piano player. I would s slip into the rooms when the uh, regular music students weren't, uh, weren't using them. And I'd, I'd leave when they'd come <laughs> to practice. Uh, but slowly I began to, uh, to learn how to play and learn how to put things together. And then I, uh, some, at some point, I immediately got the idea that I was going to have to get off of the campus 
and into the city and really meet musicians, meet different people, and really learn how to play, uh, get out to the clubs. And uh, so being a college student, uh, I didn't have a car. <laughs> so uh, learned the bus routes pretty good. And I uh, got to be pretty regular going out on the weekends, taking my classes during the week, cutting a lot of classes during the week to spend time in the library and in practice rooms, but somehow I got, I got through um, with decent, decent grades uh, and managed to uh, become a, a, a player. Another advantage that I had while I was a student here uh, that I don't talk so much about is that um, various uh, faculty members in various departments began to hire me. Uh, and that was a great opportunity to get more experienced musicians to work with me because I didn't know how much money to ask for. Uh, so uh, I asked for it to turn out to be a healthy amount, <laughs> enough, enough, enough to get musicians in the city attention. And so that's how I got people that were better than me, a little further along than me, to work with me and to bring me along. Mm -hmm. So when, uh, so anyway, to make a long story short, when, when Elaine, uh, well, actually it was Carl's wife, Barbara, who first called me uh, and told me about the, uh, the apprenticeship program. Thank you. Oh, first, oh, okay. Is that better? Nope. Oh. How's that? Yeah. Better? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, Yes, I, I think I got it. Yeah. Is that better? No, it's not. See, this is kind of in and out. Uh, go with the old school wired in mic. There you go. Yeah. So anyway, when I got the opportunity, <laughs> when I got the opportunity to work with with uh, with Carl Grubbs, um, I jumped at it because Carl was one of the first people uh, that I met when I first started. Uh, coming into the city, but I was I was so awful at that time that I couldn't really get through a song with him. So when I had the opportunity to work with him uh, uh, again in an, in, in an um, as an apprentice and, and he as a master, I jumped at it, and that turned out to be very uh, very fruitful. Um, I guess uh, I'll play a little bit for you. I'll, I'll do a couple of things for you. Um, I had an opportunity. Um, good fortune to participate in the program from both the apprenticeship um, perspective as well as the um, uh, master. Uh, from the apprenticeship uh, perspective, working with Carl, um, I had an opportunity to really uh, touch and address in real substantive ways those things of the tradition that I, I kind of had glossed over. I was coasting a little bit there, so I knew that working with Carl would give me an opportunity to solidify um, a lot of that. And I worked, we worked pretty hard to do that. Um, and that was really fruitful. From the master um, uh, perspective, I wanted to work on concept and where, where the music is in a contemporary sense. So having a, an opportunity to work with, um, with Ethan, uh, with Ethan Simon who's uh, 17 years old, uh, was really nice because his head is in a much different place than my head and Carl's head. And Carl's in his 60s, I'm in my 40s, and, and Ethan's uh, like 17. So we had a nice cross-generational um, spread and uh, set of perspectives. So um, I guess I'll play a little bit for you. I think the first thing I'll do uh, is maybe from the perspective of how we approached uh, the music with Carl, which um, would be more traditional things. I'm going to play um, maybe a John Coltrane and a Theolonius Monk piece. And then I'll play you something um, from Ethan and I's perspective. It's a, a piece I wrote for the, uh, the HBO uh, thing, The Wire. As <laughs> Thank a, you. A soon, a, a HBO miniseries, The Wire, uh, assume the position. So, I'm going to lay that on you. Thank you. Thank you. 
wonderful sign of the richness of all that you're doing and I want to thank Maryland Traditions and all of you for coming to UMBC and I'd like to invite you to ask them questions and to talk to them over food and drink um, and again thank you all for coming thank you thank you